link stakeholders, so from the regulator to the different service providers, you know, the board of trustees, and even the employers or the employees. Um, so it's, it's quite broad. Uh, but I think even from, from yesterday's you know, discussions, Mrs. Jacobs mentioned it, uh, the right honorable prime minister mentioned it, that really the, the key goal of the retirement fund industry is really for members to be able to, to retire with financial dignity. Uh, so even in the previous presentation, they talked about the net replacement ratio, and that really just speaks to members being able to retire with financial dignity, and that's really the, the ultimate goal of the industry. And sort of any challenge or risk is, is really something that, that sort of threatens that. And so our presentation is just going to cover sort of three key things. One being that you know people not being able to save enough or having sort of insufficient savings for retirement. The second being that your, your investment returns haven't earned enough. Uh, and then thirdly, we're going to touch on just the environment in terms of the impact of, of you know, the impending regulation uh, and also ESG, which is very topical in this discussion. We've heard from the unlisted managers in terms of what responsible investing is and the like. Uh, and we also have some, some thoughts and insights to share in this regard. And, and Stefan will be, will be covering that section of the presentation. Um, so, if we the CFA Institute uh, actually has an index that ranks you know, different pension funds uh, across various different countries, and they use uh, three sort of metrics which they add up to give you uh, like an overall score. Um, and those three metrics are adequacy, so in other words, are the, are the savings um, adequate you know, for, for the members? The second really speaks to the sustainability. In other words, is the existing system, is it sustainable? Um, and then the last one is just on governance and uh, the integrity of the system as a whole. And uh, Namibia has not covered sort of in the survey, um, so they, they continue to grow the survey index. More countries get added each year, so the hope is that eventually we will be part of this index. But, but nonetheless, um, South Africa is the only African country on here, and, and we can see that just in the block that says CLA, uh, sort of a, a, a rating between 50 and 60. That's sort of made where South Africa ranks, and, and, and I think it wouldn't be you know, far fetched to sort of say that we, our retirement fund industry is quite similar to South Africa. So, some might call these better, some might call these worse. I think that's uh, for, for you to decide. But, but I think uh, a C is sort of like a, a system that's quite decent in terms of features, but does still present some, some challenges. And, and, I'm, and those are the challenges that I'm just going to chat with uh, in the presentation. So the first, my first point that I outlined was not saving enough. And the previous speaker uh, or the previous session uh, was discussed a lot of the detail around pension fund savings. And um, this is a, a survey done by someone employed benefits in South Africa. So it's one of the sort of the larger renowned surveys. Um, and basically, the survey looks at of people retiring. You know, how, how many of them are retiring without a requirement for further assistance? So that 6% there that's financially independent are all the people who are retiring, who are able to retire without sort of further assistance in retirement. Then 17% of people who retire are still dependent on the state. Um, about 32% are forced to continue working when they retire. And about 45% are still dependent on one family. So, so definitely just you know, looking at, at, at that metric, you know, we can see that a lot of people you know, don't have sufficient savings or are not really able to sort of retire with that financial dignity, uh, which is really sort of the, the goal of the industry. And the, the industry benchmark, uh, in terms of how, how they typically measure whether or not you have, is what they call the net replacement ratio. So it was mentioned in the previous um, sort of discussion, but, but basically what it is, is it looks at the, 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 the income that you get when you retire, and if you divide that by what the income you're getting before you retire, is what they refer to as the net replacement ratio. And typically, industry best practice is about 70% of the net replacement ratio is, is a sort of a good benchmark to use. And um, Namibia doesn't have very good data on this, uh, but you know, some, some people estimate that it's, it's quite low, lower than 20%. I think South Africa is even 60%. But, but the key message being is that definitely there's definitely a, a need to sort of rethink and rethink how we can get people to, to save enough. So the second one, um, was that, you know, that was always the defined contribution space. And when you look at the defined benefit space, uh, we don't have many defined benefit funds. This is the largest defined benefit fund in the country, uh, the GRBF. And when you 
members. If you minus the benefits, that's the net contribution rate. And, and what you can see there is that since 2015, the net contribution rate has been going uh, sort of negative. And in the last two years, we see that it was actually a negative net contribution rate. Uh, note that this doesn't include the, the investment returns. So it's just looking at sort of the net flows of contributions versus benefits. And then you'll see some numbers there, uh, like in 2010 it's 106, and uh, 2018 it's 101%. That refers to the funding level. In other words, um, the actual valuations every three years, they value the liabilities, and what the assets are relative to the liabilities. So if it's above 100% generally, that's a, that's a good thing. And so even in a defined benefit fund, um, you know, you, you want your contributions necessarily to be positive. And if we, if we extrapolate that trend of negative uh, net contributions, uh, what it means is that for the fund to, to maintain a healthy funding level of 100%, uh, it would need their investments to obviously perform, uh, you know, to, to, to carry its work in order, in order for the fund to still remain at a, at a healthy funding level. And, and the investment return is, is a function of your investment universe. And, and the next slide just speaks to sort of the investment universe from a, a local perspective. So if we look here, these are the slides just showing uh, the, on the left. So the left it shows sort of the total assets in terms of the Namibian landscape. Um, uh, so the non-discretionary assets on the first bar on the left is uh, long-term pension, uh, sorry, pension funds and long-term insurance. So that's money that's regulated by Regulation 30. Uh, then the next bar, this, we've added sort of the collective investment schemes, unit trust, and then the small other day, just I think it's short term insurance and some medical aids. But nonetheless, that's the that's assets that we have in the market. And the local requirement is that we keep 45% of that in the media. Now, if we assume that 10%, in other words, all of the 10% is invested in due distance, and uh, due distance are the stocks that uh, they have local status, but they're listed both in. Uh, Namibia and another exchange, uh, it, it lowers it down to about 35%. So that, that pink bar is basically taking that non discretionary assets, assuming 10% is invested fully in real estate, and, and that sort of gives us a sense of the demand uh, of assets in the market. But when we actually look at what's available, um, and that's sort of the furthest right, the one with the red bar, is those are the available assets, purely local assets that we have here. So you'll see that there's equities at the bottom. Um, that's how much equities we have relative to sort of the total market. So you can see that uh, there isn't a lot of, um, our equity markets are quite small relative to the size of our assets. Uh, the next one is, is government bonds. Uh, and then on top there is, is corporate bonds. So, so already just in terms of um, you know, the regulation, uh, obviously one of the challenges is, is in getting your, your desired asset allocation uh, with sort of the available universe we have. Um, and the consequence uh, is that typically the, the red bar there has been the largest growing available asset class. Uh, and so you see that a lot of the local funds that have to comply with regulation might have a high fixed income. So it's in other words, a high weighting added towards government bonds or even maybe cash. Uh, so cash is not included in here because it's typically not a, an asset pool that, 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 that has a high weighting when you look at sort of a long term long term perspective, and there's an infinite uh, sort of supply or supply for cash. Because the bank will never say no to, to your money. You will just pay very little for it. Um, but, but nonetheless, that's the, the investment universe that, that, we, that we have. And one of the risks that we face um, currently is, is in the investment universe is uh, there's a lot of talk about inflation. Uh, so the graph here is uh, the graph of the largest of the balance sheets of some of the largest sort of economies uh, in the world. Uh, the red bar being the European Central Bank, uh, the blue, the Federal Reserve of America, Bank of Japan, Bank of England. And basically what this chart is showing is how the balance sheets of the central banks have increased quite rapidly. Uh, and you will see that sort of in the last year and a half, there's been a, a very uh, rapid increase in the size of balance sheets. And, and basically what's happening there is a lot of the central banks, you know, just due to COVID, are taking a very sort of accommodative you know, fiscal start. So they, uh, supplying a lot of liquidity to the market, you know, printing a lot of money. And typically the risks of it, inflation, you know, begins to uh, you know, go higher than you know, typically what people were, were expecting uh, sort of before that. And, and when we look at, at the market, so this is just, um, I won't go into detail on this slide, but basically it's just looking at the, the US two year and 10 year break the rates. And, 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 the, and the story here is really that you can see that it's locally, so 
that the data engineering part of the project, and then next year is sort of the yield on local equities, and then you've got the cash followed by the cash yield. Um, so the two red bars there uh, are sort of just longer term growth. So the longest red bar there is just sort of the, the growth in local earnings over the last few years, and then the, the, the bar on the far right is inflation sort of over the last 15 years. And so, so these are the yields that you currently get on, on these instruments. But when you actually look at the real yields, in other words, if you sort of take out long-term inflation, so we know that inflation is currently low, but this is uh, assume that you know, long-term inflation uh, is, is sort of a benchmark. You'll see that, you know, bonds and cash are not typically assets that perform particularly well in very high inflationary you know, markets. You, know, you, you want to have assets that can actually grow in real time. And, and typically, you know, other assets such asset classes such as equities have typically done that better in high inflationary uh, environments. And and obviously the tall red bar, like some of you might argue that uh, you know clearly the Namibian economy has been growing much faster than the past, uh, then it will grow in the future. I think that's a that's a very valid point. So we are probably unlikely to see you know growth that we've seen historically even in the local index. Um, but but nonetheless, um, we, we would typically expect you know some companies to at least be able to pass on inflation, and that's why the local yield it sort of hasn't changed from, from the previous slide that I've, that I've shown. Um, so I've spoken a little bit about inflation, and I thought it would be good to sort of illustrate um, you know why, why inflation is, is relevant in terms of how we actually go about investing and why it's real in terms of accounts. So this is just an illustration. Um, so if you think of your purchase is not quite as a rock on a, on a, on a incline or a hill, and inflation is the gradient, and uh, that you make is your investment. Uh, you, know, you, you want to at least hold your purchasing power. In other words, uh, you want to at least your money to buy what you can today with what you can, you know, let's say five or ten years down the line, because we know that the price of goods increase. So, so you want to at least your investments to grow at least at the rate of inflation so that you can protect your purchasing power. But we're talking about long-term liabilities here, and so we really want it to do more. We want it to be able to roll up the hill, and, and that's why real returns uh, are quite important uh, when, when you look at that. And then my, my last slide, before I, I sort of pass on to Stiafa to talk about ESG, is really uh, just heightened regulatory risks that we, that we are facing. Uh, so I think we, we, we spoke about this in Northern in, in the first session when the register was here, so uh, I'm not going to spend too much detail on it, but definitely some key things to highlight is definitely the policy uncertainty from an implementation perspective. Uh, we had some questions, even in terms of you know, fiduciary risk and trustee training, that it didn't seem to be clear, so I think that remains to be sort of an uncertainty in the industry. Uh, also, the higher cost of compliance, and the people that are ultimately going to pay for the higher cost of, of compliance and administration are going to be the members, which lowers the contributions that they made towards retirement, and you saw the figures that it's not looking great. So, so that's, I think, uh, a bit of a negative still on, on, on just that. And then also, some intended consequences or unintended consequences, we don't know, but definitely be likely to see a, an acceleration of standalone funds into umbrella funds. Uh, maybe the fiduciary risk is just going to become too much. The umbrellas are also likely to get a better scale benefits in the market. So, so those are just sort of some of the key things that I thought would be worthwhile um, in terms of obviously of the regulatory risk. So it's definitely you, you can make your way up and he's going to just chat to us, chat to us about um, you know investing, uh, ESG investing, and so what our thoughts and insights are in that regard. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you.